you can't teach electrical principles until you teach math. And so it's a fundamental problem that we're seeing. We're having to spend more and more money to get those, those high school graduates that maybe don't want to go on to college. It is a good career path, but it's taking us more time and more effort and more money to get them trained. And I think this is across the board. We're seeing it a lot in Southern California and in California's education system overall. But it sounds like a big number, but we can provide the details. There are many, many programs we currently have, almost 300 currently in our training program, full-time, working every day, just learning the skills. They're getting some job training out there, and then going back to the classroom. You know, just a point of interest. Um, as one of my careers early on, I was a steam plant operator. And when I was in steam plants, the majority of the individuals I worked with were you know, out of the merchant marine, out of the navy, off the ships. I mean, they knew what steam generation was. A lot of these kids now, you have to start with basic tool recognition. They've never even owned tools. And so it is, our training in safety burden is, is far more significant now than, than I think it's ever been. The final question on the $40 million fund, are additional contributions to be made to this Union fund. And if so, are you withholding them? The commission has that under consideration. The, the balance that has to be struck is that was part of a much larger agreement that over the longer term, the ratepayers are going to realize over $5 billion in pension and salary savings. And, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating that number, and it's important. We got no colas out of IBW for multiple years. We got significant pension reform. Within 10 years, a big number of our new employees are going to be on the new pension. So you have to be very careful when you look at a contract in its totality to be able to pick and choose. I really would not like to upend this particular agreement. Now that having been said, the commission is considering their options. They are adamant in terms of the transparency of the dollars. I do not expect them to let up on that one iota. Now we have a series of questions uh, from Louis Girondo, who will stand up, Janet Couples, Jay Beelan, Even, Elke, and Judy Rachel. And these questions all relate to uh, the solar program of DWP. So the first one is, what is the department's position on support for solar generation, particularly for those whose usage is small or may have the ability to generate more than they use? So our position on solar is we very much support it. So we've had an incentive program. It's available to all our customers that would like to put solar on a rooftop. But the incentive part, that's all of your money. You're, you're paying to incentivize somebody to put it on. We only want them to put on as much solar on their own roof as what they use. We don't want to incentivize them to put on more solar than they will use themselves. Um, we do look at, at maybe your potential use. Maybe you're going to go buy an electric plug-in vehicle. Maybe, maybe you're going to buy a hybrid that plugs in, and that's your new car, so you're going to use a lot more going forward. So you might be looking at a system a little larger than you need for your own house today. That's important. In the future, not today, uh, we, we will potentially have better programs to buy back. Right now, we will take your energy excess that you produce, and we bank it. It's yours. We bank it. You will be able to draw it down as you use energy going forward into future years even. Uh, we have another program called a feed-in tariff. That's a program where you have solar built, built it on commercial buildings, and they deliver it directly to DWP and we pay them. So we'll sign a contract, 20, 25 years, we'll pay them for that and that's called a feed-in tariff. But LADVP is very supportive of additional development of solar. I do want to say, too, we're working at options um, to, 
to create something called community solar. Because the problem I have is that right now solar is advantageous to a homeowner whose roof or situation allows them to install it. Um, and I'm not totally sure that the pricing equation using our current rate structure reflects the interest of those who don't have that opportunity. So in addition to revisiting that, we're looking at community solar type programs where people can band together and buy shares on facilities that maybe aren't directly related to their house and obtain some of the same advantages. Good, good idea. Um, the equipment purveyors say that the economics aren't there except for high volume users, that there's no way to pay for the equipment. Do you agree with that? Equipment purveyors? Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, the people that sell we purvey equipment. Yes, <laughs> correct. I try to answer it. I'm just not sure what they're asking me. You're asking. Is it related to solar? Or who's to solar. Solar. Yeah. solar. People who sell the solar. Solar. Who, people who sell the solar. Yeah. People sell the solar. Well, for those of you who are, are vendors, you know, most respectfully, or maybe not, um, <laughs> they're in business to sell you something. The, I spent a lot of time in Anaheim taking calls and making tools available for people to be able to assess um, the people who were trying to sell them something. We all want to be sustainable, and we want to do the right thing for the environment, we want to lower our bills, but, but um, some of the marketing approaches I'm not wild about. Now that having been said, solar generation is a passive facility. Even though newer technology may become available that's more aesthetically appropriate, or cheaper, that system will be gener generating energy for a long time. So if, if you're going to stay there, you're going to get the bang for the buck out of it. But you're going to see the equipment continue to drop. And the minute internationally you see a market where China enters, you know right then that the, the cost of the technology is going to be heading down. That's not to say about the quality of the technology um, at that point either. But, but yeah, it's going to get less expensive when you see big international moves like that. Is DWP going to start paying people for the excess electricity we could produce with our rooftop solar panels? If that energy was supplied to us in a time and manner that would allow us to offload other generating resources, thereby saving everybody money, I think the answer would be yes. But right now, as an example, you all know we create energy as you demand it. Okay, we don't have a lot of storage facilities. We actually, the generators move in concert with your demand. And you actually draw these fascinating load curves at different times of the day, um, days of the year, times of the month. It's fascinating to watch your consumption. I can tell when you all get home at night and turn the TVs on. Look at some of these things. But we have to predict months and weeks in advance, and we have to secure resources for you in advance because the compact we have is not that I shut you off when I run out. You expect that light to come on every time you turn the switch under all conditions. So that means we need to procure your energy in advance, allowing for contingencies. So we have this curve. Now we have, let's say, in the middle of the day, a lot of solar systems, and they're in excess of your needs, so they start pumping back into the system. We can get in, into a situation where we're actually generating more, and we were, we'll be backing off far cheaper resources, like hydro plants, in order to take that injection of energy. So we've got to work as a group to move our portfolio to cleaner supplies, and ensure we don't create these situations of subsidies where money is moving between classes and we're not necessarily all gaining the, the benefit. Don Lappa asked, I hear electricity costs less in non-peak hours, for example, 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Is this true? How does the meter reading, reading know the time of day or not? <laughs> There's a little man who's standing there. <laughs> It, it doesn't. It became really popular to talk about time of use pricing and yeah. peak pricing. And, and of course, we only know that on a macro scale because, as I said, we watch those load curves. So I know what you're doing as a group. I don't know what you're doing in your particular house at, at any particular time, but I do know the difference between peak load periods and low load periods. Pricing is a different issue. As I said earlier, we go out and procure for you well in advance the majority of those resources. 
but there's a, a kind of a margin that floats on the top that reflects the fact that maybe last Monday at this time of year there was more clouds than there was today. So today's load is 50 megawatts higher. There's a margin. That electricity is purchased in real time and those prices can fluctuate. I think what really came about when people were talking about the hourly pricing is you had a lot of economists and they're talking about market signals and trying to adjust the tariffs and cause you to act in one way or another. And ultimately, when the information technology catches up to that point and we can make those investments, and by the way, I really don't want to spend a billion dollars on meters and then be technologically outstripped in two years and have you need some other new kind of technology overall. So there, there's a lot of issues related to that, but, but um, go ahead. I can tell you want to fix something I said. Go ahead. <laughs> so if, if you're not home during the day, so you're, you're away from your home all day long and you don't really use energy, you don't keep your air conditioner on, you're away, we do have for residential customers time of use meters. So it is a meter that will, will measure the time of use so when you actually use it, and we do have cheaper pricing periods. So if you're primarily using your energy in those off-peak hours, it is much lower in cost. And you can, you can ask, uh, you can get a hold of us, and you can request a time of use meter and an analysis to determine would you be better off doing that versus the, your normal meter just measures your total usage and it divides or multiplies by a number to give you your rate. But a time of use has three different billing periods, and so based on when you actually use, your price is different. It's available to all residential. It is mandatory for all of our commercial customers. Just remember, if you want to move to time of use, and your kids come home at three and flip that air conditioner on for you, you will get a nasty surprise when your bill comes. So work with us in terms of the analysis of how and when you use your energy so you make a good choice. Uh, please comment on the issue that the city generates much more renewable power than it gets credit for. The city does not count as renewable energy the power that comes from the hydroelectric plants in the Owens Valley because they generate, quote, too much, unquote, power. I don't know if it's necessarily the Owens Valley, but we don't necessarily get renewable credit for our Cascade Power Plant, which is one of the largest uh, hydroelectric facilities on the West Coast. And that was intentional by the regulatory bodies, because if we had been able to count it, LA would have been done. So they took large, large hydro plants out of the mix so we couldn't necessarily count them, because regulations are intended to force a certain response. And so we weren't allowed to count them. Is there anything about the Owen Scourge electricity that is germane here? So we did get a lot of change that let us now count our Owens Valley power plants. They still have yet to be certified. We can't count the big hydro. We can't count Hoover Dam. How many of you knew we were involved in building Hoover Dam, LADWP? LADWP operated Hoover Dam for the first 50 years. But we, we don't get to count Hoover Dam. Uh, the federal government now operates it, but we're the largest off taker of Hoover Dam. And that does not count as renewable, but it is clean and no emissions, and how safe we're not able to count. I have a couple questions on tiers for billing. Uh, Judy, Rachel, and, and myself, a uh, question in parts of, of all of Sherman Oaks is the median temperature zone, the same as West Los Angeles, but it appears that the weather is more similar to Van Nuys than West LA. Uh, why, why is parts or all Sherman Oaks considered a medium temperature zone? Oh, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many of you lived in Van Nuys and had your city name changed to Sherman Oaks? Because I just did all of your billing changes on all of your envelopes, so your bills now say Sherman Oaks and not Van Nuys. And uh, Mrs. Ramsey, which you So, you, you did a lot of work to call yourselves Sherman Oaks and not Van Oaks. So you kind of moved your temperatures off a little bit. It was a determination based on aggregate historical temperatures, and it was just, they, they did a cutoff, it was 
uh, committee structure, work with both the city council, with the commission at the time, to establish how they set those tiers and zones. How many different tiers are there? How many different zones? Zones. I think there are three zones. What are they? I think there's a hot, a medium, and a cold. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a process for uh, changing the zone? So, so the, the theory behind it, obviously, is depending on the temperatures on your end, you might need to use more cooling, uh, and so therefore more electricity. And so you received a greater allocation medium tier for electricity based on the zones. Uh, and it, again, it was just based on uh, using accessible temperature data with a committee structure uh, work through the city council. And it's certainly something that can be revisited. We look at a future rate case and the opportunity to look at tiering, how that whole process works. I can tell you from now running the new billing system, it makes billing very, very complicated. And if you can imagine the implementation of a new billing system, we have to understand how many people live in every house, what temperature zone you live in, how much square footage you have in your yard, because you get different allocations and tiers. Every customer is now a custom bill. Every customer is now a custom bill. And just so you're aware, there. Other cities don't do this. They charge you based on the kilowatt hours you use or the acre feet of water that you use. And then that allows a lot of that money, because again, this is zero sum game. This is all, where do you take money from and who do you give money to? That's why it has to work through a committee process and through city hall and involve the politicians. If we had our brothers, we could save a lot of money by simply just charging people based on their use. But as Randy said, we have very, very complex billing, which is also one of the challenges we've had with the new billing system rollout. Marvin Kaufman, William Brandt, they, they would like to comment on how well customer service is. <laughs> Marvin says, today had occasion to phone DWP a non-urgent installation for my condo complex. I had a 30 minute wait to have the agent inform me I have to call commercial section, not residential. Almost two hours wait for the next agent to refer me to maintenance, and then five minutes of that level. Please come. <laughs> we are the government and we are here to help you. <laughs> of course that's crappy customer service. It's not like we're not well aware of that. That is not how you deal with customers. Not in any way, shape, or form. So all of our efforts right now are in trying to reform the system, to make the computer software changes, to get the customer service reps trained and hired, to provide alternative ways for you to do business with us, either through the interactive voice response systems or online. But that's an example of exactly what we don't want to do. Now, William Brand, I guess, reports some good news. It only took, he only had a 27 minute. Wait. Excellent, thank you so much for that. <laughs> but he says the, the building system, he is on auto pay. He, uh, he double paid it by mistake and he got no auto refund. He <laughs> got no refund? No yeah, he says no auto refund. So oh, he no. double paid on the auto pay, but no automatic refund. Go ahead, Michelle, take a shot. Um, as far as. <laughs> As far as the auto pay is concerned, that is my understanding, and that's another section, I apologize, so I'm going to just wing it from what I recall, is the way that auto pay is set up is that's a relationship between the customers and your banking institution. So when the money's coming out and you're allocating that money to go towards your utility bill, if there is something that is taken out that exceeds the amount that should not have come out, that the customer then has to negotiate that information with their their instant their banking institution because we don't have authorization to do that. So M Michelle is correct. One thing we do not do is we don't keep your account numbers ourselves to your banking <coughs> institution. So I can't just put your money back in an account because I don't keep that record. It, it's a one way uh, activity, and, and there's a reason. There's several reasons for that. 
but if you need that refund, so it will apply to your next bill. There's no doubt. It will show up as a credit and apply to your next bill. If you want that money back, if you need that money, you can contact us a number of ways. You can email us through through the online system, and we can issue you a check. It's typically a seven to ten day uh, to receive your check back, but we cannot just put the money back in your account. We don't have that capability. Michelle Hutchins and John Keller have both have questions concerning chloramine, and one of them says, Michelle says. Uh, we've learned of health issues concerning the addition of chloramine to the water supply. It's expensive and difficult to filter out, and there are safer and more efficient alternatives available. So my question is, are you aware of these issues concerning chloramine, and are you concerned about the issue as we are? Would you be willing to create a committee or special investigation to look into the problems and into the alternatives to its use? No, 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 don't give that to me. <laughs> um, and the other question is, what is chloramine? <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't even answer the first one. <laughs> there are a variety of ways of, dis of disinfecting water. They all have pros and cons to them. There have been any number of analysis studies, Department of Health, you name it. It's just the same issue as fluoride. People feel very strongly about it one way or another. Um, to my knowledge, and this I will have to double check, my apologies for not bringing a water guy that had that expertise tonight. But I believe that we are mandated at this juncture to do that, but I am not sure, and I'll get back to you on that one. Next question. The guy well, who needed extra writing room on his, I like yes. that. Well, this for Esther Levy gets the prize tonight. It's typewritten and handwritten, so I can read it. And she says, I'm a fan of the beautiful Japanese gardens in the Sebulba Basin. I've heard rumors that the DWP, the Department of Sanitation, have plans in the future to add to the existing water reclamation plant next to the garden. They want to build a plant that further cleans the water. The problem is the site they chose will eventually, in eventually intrude and destroy the garden. This site will be very visible to the public, whereas there are other sites that would not harm the garden that would not be visible to the public. I'm for keeping the Japanese garden. What do you say? That's one that's got to go back with me. I don't have the Japanese garden issue in front of mind at the moment. All right. And the next question. Hal Schneider asks, name three subjects or procedures that will be banned during your new administration. <laughs> See, I like this. She says, okay, no margaritas before noon. That is now my new personal barrier. Um, I hate to answer this, you know, pragmatically, but the things I need to do first is I need to get the phone answered. I need to get the billing out. I need to get the agency to understand that the people we work for are the people they come in contact with every single day. I appreciate our policy body and they set all those standards, but the people we are beholden to are all sitting in this room. We are not doing our best job. And there's lots of varying aspects to this. Like the earlier joke about, you know, five guys standing around and one guy shoveling and 47 people supervising. Bear in mind that a lot of those requirements are established outside of Los Angeles, that you have specified numbers of safety observers. These aren't necessarily things that people are just sitting around moving on. What do I want to do different? I want us to be more responsive. I would rather somebody answer a customer first and me second. And as long as I keep that up, that will continue to translate through the organization because I will reward positive customer behaviors. I will respond to negative customer behaviors. So well, that's not exactly three things, because I could probably come up with more than three, but that's the general idea. Here's the final question uh, from the drum roller, Mrs. Dell. Uh, I compared my old DWP bills to my new DWP bills, and I'm outraged. Who do I contact? A couple things. One is Michelle Moore. 
and I am serious, make sure Michelle has your particular information, because I know there are some of you that have specific billing issues or specific concerns. I want to make sure we get that information. Um, but the other thing I want is, I put up a website now, it's called Tell Me DWP or Tell Me LA DWP. If you put that in and search it, a form will pop up, and it will go directly to me. Now, I would really appreciate it if you would make a couple passes at trying to solve your problem through the regular channels. Because if 80,000 people email me tomorrow, it's going to take me a while to work through those. But that is a direct link. I look at those every single day. And I follow up to ensure that they get addressed in some way, shape, or form. So that, that's kind of my first outreach to try to keep connected um, with all of you. And, and there will be more of that to follow Okay, we've completed the questions. Thank you very much. A uh, couple things. Uh, before you leave, Jules, Jules has a few uh, uh, raffle items for some uh, great meals at Jinkies, so stick around for that, get your numbers up. Uh, but before you leave, please clean up your, your, your areas. There's a recycling area that LP provides for us to recycle all the paper that you're not going to be using paper. in front of you, and all your trash, please go in the containers. Jules?